Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Um, excited to kick off today with our first guest. Um, if you haven't yet, please take one more minute to email me the attendance question, why are you here at FIT? And um, we'll move a little forward. There are a few new students this week, about 10 maybe, that weren't here last week. So I'm just going to cover a couple of things we covered last week. And of course, if you have questions, even if you were here last week, you can chime in. Um, but generally, this is our way our schedule works for class. Doors open at 4. Um, at 4.10, I'll kick off with announcements and um, attendance. Uh, by 4.15, if you haven't emailed me, you would be tardy for the class. And then by 4.30, you're cut off. Um, we're re receiving credit for the class. And we end at 6. Um, as noted, email me the answer to the question that I'll usually post. Sometimes we'll do it live, and we'll actually talk through the questions. But oftentimes, I'll just have you guys email me. Here is another snapshot of our schedule. Um, today we have Randy Goldberg, who I'll introduce to you guys in a moment. But ne next week we have Austin Zung, who's the creative director at Ann Taylor. Um, then President's Day, so a week off. Um, El Elodie Lifshitz is coming from Rag and Bone the following week. She's a senior design director there. And then we have um, our first costume designer, Maria Cooper, who does some film, theater, and television. Um, and then on 3-9, we have uh, Sergio Guatemara, who is um, of Cel Celestino Couture, but is on Project Runway this season. And then we have a historical costume designer the following week, Hunter Kazarowski. Um, I'm going to continue to post this every week. I also post this entire PowerPoint to Blackboard, so you're welcome to go back and check it out. Um, one thing of note that I've added in here is there, if there's a room change, there are four dates as of right now where we cannot be in this space. So just make sure you're noting that, and I'll make sure to send out an announcement the week of. Um, the first time is on March 9th, so we have, we have some time. Any questions? Yes. Oh, sure. It's, um, there you go. Hmm. Um, so two things that are due somewhat soon that I'm just going to mention to you guys, the two fashion critiques are due by March 9th. Um, these are attending two different fashion-related events and writing a critique. These are posted on Blackboard and can be, and need to be submitted on Blackboard for credit. Are there, are there any questions on that before I move forward? Yeah. I'm sorry? What are the limits for what the event can be? Um, attending a fashion show, um, a fashion-related party, a fashion launch. Oh, um, there are questions posted. It's about five different questions. So, and I posted it in Word, so you can download it first and know it and write offline if you want to, and then go back and submit them. Any other questions? Okay. And then lecture prep questions. You need to do two of these throughout the course of the semester. So choosing two different lecturers to write down four questions for an advance, typed up, coming to class, and answering one of those questions, and asking one of those questions in class, um, and then turning it in to me in a hard copy before you leave class that day. Just a reminder, we have a Facebook group where announcements come on, um, and it's great for you to join. Also, if you join now and you continue to live in and work in New York City or study here, you can come back and see who's going to be here um, to attend future events. So I highly recommend joining in. OK, if there's any, are there any questions before I move forward? Great. Well, then, at, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Randy Goldberg to you guys. He is the co-founder and chief brand officer at Bombas. He is responsible for bringing the ideas, principles, and stories of Bombas to life. And in addition, Goldberg oversees product design and community and giving at Bombas. Goldberg graduated from the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University and is a veteran in digital creative copywriting strategy and branding. He has written, developed, and directed unique content for top companies, including Nike and Vitamin Water, and led the creative direction of digital media brand Urban Daddy. Prior to Bombas, Goldberg co-founded Tennis Partners, a creative consultancy in Pop-Up Flea, a yearly pop-up market focused on well-made and time-tested products. Goldberg has been featured on NBC's Today Show, ABC's Shark Tank, Morning Joe, CBS This Morning, Bloomberg TV, and in the New York Times. He was named 2017 Entrepreneur of the Year at Georgetown University. Please join me in welcoming Randy. <laughs> I'm actually just going to put your, uh, your website up as well. Okay. 
Right. Welcome. Yes, I know. A little bright. Um, Hello. <laughs> so tell us where the idea for Bombas originally came from. Sure. So uh, Bombas, we make socks. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but um, I was working at a media company uh, called Urban Daddy, and my partner in Bombas, he and I worked together, and we would share ideas often and, and talk about potential ideas for starting a business, but you know, we just talked, we were kind of interested in the idea. And one day he came over to my desk and he said, I saw a quote on Facebook that said, socks are the most requested clothing item in homeless shelters. And he asked me if I knew and I didn't. And I thought that it was, you know, kind of a sad thing and a, an afterthought. And neither one of us had heard that this was such an issue. So we started calling some shelters. We weren't thinking, hey, there's a great business idea here. We were thinking, wow, how can we help get involved with this issue? So. We called some homeless shelters in the city and we started asking questions and it turns out that you're not allowed to donate used socks to shelters for hygiene reasons. So if you're living on the street, a fresh pair of socks means a lot. You might not get to wash your socks that often. A lot of uh, medical and health issues come up and it's a, a huge, a huge need. And for people to donate socks, they will have to go buy new socks and bring them to a shelter and it's sort of one step further than most people were willing to do. So shelters would have to buy socks or spend budget on that or they just didn't have them. So we said, all right, what if we donated some socks? And we started to do that. And then we started to think, you know, Tom's has been around for a few years and they're kind of killing it. And their one-for-one -one model that they use is interesting. Maybe there's something there. Maybe we could, you know, kind of take that approach to socks. And when we started to think about socks, we realized that athletic socks especially hadn't changed in 50 years. It was just kind of the same white and black socks out there. And we had a connection to a factory and we used that connection to start tinkering with a new and improved version of a sock and it took us two years to make this pair of socks that we wanted but we had gotten obsessed so we were just really focused on the details and making a really high quality product and the idea was pretty simple right you know we wanted to donate a lot of socks and we could only do that if we sold a lot of socks and we could only do that if we made amazing product so we worked on that and then we put out a Indiegogo campaign and did really well and we used that money to build our website and, and then we were like, now what? We need to get customers. But we just started kind of doing that through you know, word of mouth and organic marketing and then Shark Tank came calling and we used that as sort of the next springboard for the company and we focused on building our brand and focused on building our donation network and focused on making an amazing product and we've built it over the years and now we've donated 35 million pairs of socks and we have giving partners in all 50 states. We have 3,500 shelters that we work with and um, 130 people working at the company here in New York. It's huge, it's great, great success story. How did you get going with Indiegogo, your, your Indiegogo campaign and, and you know, get the word of mouth out there to, to yeah, customers? Yeah, that was, you know, for us, we didn't have any money. Um, so we were like, all right, well, how can we build something, get some, some capital to help build a website and do our first production run? And we thought about, Indiegogo. Um, at the time, we, you know, there were Kickstarter was also an option, but Indiegogo seemed better for charitable-based business. And we we built a we spent a lot of time on our video, and yeah. I, I think thinking through the script for that video was like writing the covenant of our company and making sure that we understood how to talk about and get credit for the things that we were doing. And then the rest of it was really elbow grease. Yeah. I mean, once we launched the campaign, we treated it like a full-time job. We pestered our friends on Facebook and said, you know, this is live. We've been talking about this. I see you haven't contributed. Why haven't you do it today? And we just hounded people. And I think the persistence paid off, and we were able to get some press. And then Indiegogo featured it in their newsletter, and it kind of took off. And we had a goal of raising $15,000, and we raised $140,000. Wow. And then we were able to use that money to make our first production run and to build our website and just kind of took off from there. But people ask, people ask us about Indiegogo all the time and our answer was really just treating it like a job, not like a campaign, not like uh, we put this video out and hope it works, but we engaged with every person that bought. We asked them to share it with their friends. We tried to uh, like 
we just pushed it as hard as we could to the point of annoyance, I think, and, and maybe that's why it worked. Yeah. Was it your full-time job? Because I know a lot of people don't jump right into the pool when they're, when they're going to start their own company. Yeah, so at first it wasn't. Um, for that first two years while we were developing the product, we were both working. And yeah. when we decided, yeah, I mean, again, yeah. we didn't have any money. So we had to figure out how to do it and make it work and do it on nights and weekends. And, you know, probably would have happened faster if we were doing it full time. Yeah. You know, because we could have maybe taken a trip to the factory and we could have, you know, but w we didn't we didn't have that time pressure and there was no investor breathing down our neck. So we developed the product at our own pace. And then when we decided it was time to launch the campaign, that's when we were both like full time on the project. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so walk us through your career path prior to Bombas. Obviously, I just gave the, the bird's eye view of it. But yeah, <laughs> it's a, I mean, man, it's kind of a winding path. I don't think anyone ever like grows up dreaming of being in the sock business. Um, but, you know, maybe now, you've inspired maybe now, you maybe now I've inspired <laughs> some of that. Uh, I was a finance major, as you said, but I never worked in finance. It wasn't really my calling. Um, I came out of school and got a job in a consulting company and then got laid off seven months. It was a recession. I'm old. It was in 2001. Um, it was a lot like 2008, I guess, 2009. So it was tough. And I didn't have a job and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew what I was doing I didn't like. And so I just started interviewing. I took a lot of interviews and I interviewed at, you know, big companies like Gap and I interviewed at banks because I had worked in finance. And in the meantime, I was working at a restaurant, um, waiting tables, and I was working at another store. So I was working at a store, working at a restaurant, and I met some people who would come into the restaurant, and they worked at an ad agency, and we became friends, and they thought that I might be good at what they did, and they gave me a chance to do a copywriting project wow. for a brand. And it's one of those things where, like, okay, this makes sense. You feel like you're good at that thing, and it worked out, and it was a good opportunity, and then I started freelancing more as a writer. And the more I did that, the more work that I got. And then I moved to New York. And I started freelancing here in New York. And then I got a job at an ad agency in Brooklyn and worked on, it was like a digital agency. So we worked on sites for a lot of, uh, I think we worked for Nike and we worked for Sony and we worked for Google. And then from there, I I already met the, um, the people from Urban Daddy. And I went to work there, which was a media company. And I was helping run the editorial team there and building a little agency inside of that company. And that's where I met Dave. And now I work at a sock company. So <laughs> the one thing I always tell people is you never know where you're going to end up. You know, you think you want to do something coming out of school. You got to go try it and give it your best chance and figure it out and keep your eyes open because there could be another opportunity that works out. And your calling probably, you know, isn't clear to you yet. And that's okay. You know, you just follow the work. Definitely, and your network. I feel like sure. sounds like you 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 leaned on your network a lot throughout the. Throughout yeah, the I mean, I, I leaned on my friends and my family for support. It, it wasn't always easy, and you know my network. Yeah, but I, I, you know, it's not. You know, it's just sort of you're in a bar and you meet someone and yeah. end up getting an opportunity. That's I don't think that's, I don't think I'm the best networker. Yeah. But. Yeah. I do. I have always kept my eyes open for opportunities, and I always said to myself, I don't care about the name brand. I just want to do the work, and I want to get good at something. And, you know, yeah. that's sort of the, been the approach. You know, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting, though, because I think that some of the guests I've had in here, you never know who you're going to meet that's going to help you get there. And for sure. I mean, getting your job, getting your first job, kind of that starts your path out of a bar, you know, career Bar, or a bar job, rather, is a very interesting thing that could have happened. I actually had someone in last semester who um, was at a party wearing a Jean-Paul Gaultier hat, and Jean-Paul Gaultier was there and went up to talk to him. And because of that, everyone else in the party was like, ooh, who is this guy? <laughs> and went to talk to him, and that kind of launched his career in the next step. So it is really interesting, you know, how just being open and friendly sure. is enough. Friendly is good. Kind of yeah. get you to that. <laughs> get you the Friendly is good. Smart is good. I mean, the yeah. listen, people... It's hard to replicate a path that sounds like that, but not really, right? The idea is that you're interested in something and you try it and you bring your unique perspective to it and your ideas and you trust your gut about what is right or what isn't right at a company and you learn from that. And if it's not right, you have the, f have the courage to leave and to go try something else and to find people that you know, have the thing that, might be, that maybe you, know, you want to learn from. And then you take that to the next level. And 
eventually you start to pick up on the things that you feel most valuable at and th that you can help out with and the place that you want to create is your own. And, you know, my path is more about that. It's about keeping your eyes open and learning about yourself along the way and trying to be around people that are inspiring more than it is about, you know, what you do in each job. It's more about the why than the what. Yeah, that's great. Um, tell us more about your other current ventures, um, Tennis Partners and Pop-Up Plea. Former ventures. Former. Okay. Yeah. So, no, it's all right. Um, I looked over these, so I should have yeah. said something. But uh, <laughs> Tennis Partners was, and when I was working, um, you know, around the same time I started Bombas, I just started a little agency to work with brands on building websites and doing marketing, creative, creative direction. And we were sort of using that in the beginning times of Bombas so that I didn't have to take a salary at the company. So, you know, it was just working a second job basically to support the growth of Bombas. And Papa Flea I had had running for about 10 years as another side project. That I started with another friend of mine when we, we kind of felt like the store, the menswear store that we wanted didn't exist in New York. So we said, why don't we open a store? Um, that seemed crazy because we had jobs and it's a really hard thing to do and a lease and all that. And we said, let's open a store for a weekend. So we opened a pop-up shop and we invited our favorite brands, kind of curated a, a selection of companies that we wanted to see in the same room, the kind of place we'd want to shop where people who were running the brands would be there. And this was at a time when we started it in 2009 where it was very expensive to have e-commerce for a small brand. And it was also very expensive to have your own store, like to be committed to a 10-year lease. So a lot of these companies were at the mercy of department stores and wholesalers, and that was just a terrible thing for most of them because they couldn't control how their brand showed up in the marketplace. When you have something that is yours and it's a small thing, you want it to be the way you want it to be. So this was a place where those people could show up, fans of the brands could come and meet them, and it turned into a a big annual event in New York, and then we took it to LA and Tokyo and Austin, Texas, and it became oh. like a traveling weekend pop-up yeah. market. Um, yeah, and some of the like startup brands you see today, like Warby Parker and Harry's had their first retail experiences at Pop-Up Flea, That's and awesome. we would have like big brands also, like uh, J. Crew would have like a Made in America capsule collection there, or would do something, and then you have the small up-and-coming brands, or brands would come over from Japan that we liked, so yeah. it was a big mix. Great, really interesting. So um, I am super curious, and I, I actually did some research this week and watched your Shark Tank episode. I don't, I don't oh know God. if anyone else has done that, or if you were big fans and watched it originally. Um, so tell us about the prep for that and, and kind of how it all went down. Has anyone else seen it? I see nodding heads. One, two, okay. <laughs> so you've seen me Shark like fans? sweating profusely on national TV? <laughs> yeah, okay. That's basically what I remember from that experience. It's just like sweating. Um, I can imagine I would too. <laughs> it, mostly for the lights. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of like this. It's a little like this, <laughs> but you know, a little more intense. Um, yeah. The prep work was insane uh, and very productive for our business. So, your prep involves like stacks of legal documents, and you're never really sure if it's real or if you're actually going to get to go and and film. Um, all the, along the way, they, they keep telling you it might not happen or it might happen, and this is, they never tell you exactly when until like three weeks before, and then the same for when it's going to air. But <clears throat> at some point, you realize that if you go on the show, you're going to be on national television, and they can ask you anything they want. And if you don't have a good answer prepared for everything that you don't want to talk about in your business, it's going to be bad. And you've seen enough episodes of that show that it's gone really bad. Yeah. So I think we were motivated a little bit by the fear of saying something just really horrible on national TV and motivated also by the opportunity for exposure for our company. Yeah. You know, it almost seems like they're trying to get you to say something bad as well. They're trying to make a good TV show. <laughs> yeah. Right? So <laughs> what you have control of is what you say in your pitch, and that's basically it. Yeah. So you got to nail that and then just have good answers prepared. That's great. Um, well, you didn't cry, so, I mean, that's huge. I didn't cry on cry. air. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, obviously after that, I, I know Damon stepped in. How, how else was he involved other than cash flow from, from there? And yeah, Damon's, Damon's been a great mentor for us. Um, that's obviously a guy who's built a big apparel business uh, from nothing, right? So he, he saw in us a little bit of what he was doing and... He's helped shape what our business looks like and how we've built it and remains a, a, a constant sort of 
source of inspiration and mentorship for Dave and myself and the other founders in our business. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, he's a great guy. Um, a little bit different than he is on TV and uh, just really, really smart and has all the experiences. He's a, a really smart guy and I would recommend, you know, reach out to him. He's, he loves hearing from people. Yeah. I, do you feel it's really satisfying though now to watch watch uh, the kind of the reaction to you and where, where Bombas is now? Oh, I thought you were going to say to watch Shark Tank. Yeah. I had to take like two years off of watching, <laughs> sort of like a PTSD yeah. thing. But um, yeah, to to watch the reaction of people. Yeah, to well, I mean, the reaction that they had to you that day. I feel like all the other investors were kind of yeah. They said hard, no. They were harsh. They were no, really harsh. Yeah, right? Yeah, they were harsh. And then uh, yeah, and Dave but also you get it. They're trying to make you know TV. TV. Totally. And yeah. we had had other investors who were interested, so we felt confident about the business and really confident about, a pro about the product. So, yeah, yeah. You so know. it's kind of like this would be great, but we'll be fine either way. We'll be fine if it doesn't work out. It yeah. it worked out, and it was it helped take. What it did was help raise the floor. Yeah. Oh shit. Mm. <laughs> 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 uh, quite the ring. <clears throat> um, so you mentioned you have 130 employees now. Yeah. How are you guys set up? Um, it's a pretty big. Pretty big operation. Yeah. Um, to 130. Yeah. Our our operation we're set up. Um, you know we have all the typical apparel company departments and divisions, right? So there's sourcing, product development, design, manufacturing, merchandising, planning, accounting, finance, brand, creative, marketing, in uh, customer service. Um, yeah. I mean. You know, we think about those paths, right? Like from uh, concept to customer, and then we think about like the ideation to content, and you know, and like just try and work around those ideas. And we have a pretty robust giving arm. Where we work on building our network of partner shelters and organizations across all 50 states, where we donate product and we learn from them, and we publish information about them, and we have a great relationship with that group. That's great. Are you? Um Obviously, for now, you're strictly in the U.S. with giving. Are you, is there plans to go bigger? Yeah, when, when we launch international, I mean, we sell internationally now through our site, but it's, we make it really hard for people, not on purpose. We're working on it. But yeah. when we launch f internationally for real, we'll also launch our giving efforts internationally. But we're really focused on this problem in the U.S. Yeah. right now. Yeah. And um, forgive me, are you guys only direct to consumer or do you do any wholesale? We have some wholesale. Yeah, so we're in uh, Nordstrom and Dick's Sporting Goods. But... That's about 2% of our business right now, or 98% is through our website. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, well, that's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're working on it. You know, we sort of, our approach to wholesale has always been cautious. Um, just you look around at, like, the store environment and what stores you want to be in, and it, it can be really tricky, and uh, that's the way a lot of brands go wrong, I think. Yeah, yeah. Where they show Especially up now. Too, too much too soon in depressing stores. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to avoid that. Um, yeah. So we focused on the place where we can control the story and the experience and the products that we're selling and, and, and kind of get everything, get people through the, p the path in the right way on our website. That's great. Um, what do you feel like is the hardest part about running your own company? Oh, the hardest part. It, it's hard a lot, um, but it, the, the good is definitely better than the bad uh, every day and in aggregate. Um, the responsibility for 130 people and you know, creating a, a safe space for everybody to be heard and to put, bring their backgrounds and experiences to Bombas, that, take that responsibility very seriously. We just want to be a really good place to work. If we only focused on that, I think the rest will take care of itself. That's sort of our idea. Yeah. And that's why no one tends to leave, I think, which is good. We have a lot of people who are super invested and believe in what we're doing and are there because of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, happy people do good work. That's true. <laughs> um, what do you think the hardest part is? Um, the hardest part. I mean, the hardest part is figuring out. I mean, we're pretty open about what we don't know as like a leadership team, and but sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. I know that sounds like a obscure concept, but learning to know what you don't know is the m is is really tricky and but super important for us because then you can solve it. If you know what you don't know, then you can bring people in to help yeah. you do it. That's right. Yeah, that's great. Um, how, how, how do you and your partner work together? There, there are four of us who started the business. Um, so Dave, who's our CEO, he, you know, he handles that yeah. CEO things. Yeah. You know, um, I oversee brand, creative, product design, 
community and giving and wholesale, things that we think are most the most important thing about them are through the brand lens and how we're represented and what they stand for and making sure that's right. So wholesale is a brand idea more than it is a revenue idea, <coughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then one other guy is a chief creative officer and the other guy is our COO. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so the, how, how does the design process work? Are you guys mostly based off replenishment or is there a lot of in and out product? It's both. Um, we have a I'm sorry, if, I'm not sure if you guys know the term replenishment. That's, that'd be product that comes in day in, day out. It's there you know, 365 days a year and you just continue to fill in um, the back order versus like a fashion trend item would be in and out. You know, I don't know the sock life cycle, but in apparel, you know, monthly deliveries basically in and out. Yeah, thankfully we're not. I mean, we have a t-shirts now, um, yeah. but for our sock business, it's probably 70% core, 30% fashion. Yeah. That's kind of how we split it up. Okay. <coughs> um, you know, there is a big core component of it. People, but there's also high substitutability and the fashion stuff does really well. And we tend to sell out every year. So we don't have any off price channels. We just kind of sell through things. Great. Yeah. Good, good model. <laughs> good, good business if you can have a hind it, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Um, where is your work brought you travel-wise? Oh, man. Um, so we make our t-shirts in Peru. I've been to Peru to see our factories. You know, it takes 100 steps to make one white t-shirt. Isn't that crazy? 100 <laughs> steps if you think about, like, the cotton to the cotton gin, the yarn. Like, it's, it's a pretty wild thing to see. Um, and it's good to know if these are the things that you care about, right? If you're into designing apparel, Think about where it's made and how it's made, and you gotta go visit some place that makes stuff. Even there's a lot of places that make things here. Just seeing those steps is super helpful. Um, but I go to, uh, we have factories in China as well, so I've been there. And when I go to China, I usually go to Japan, just because I really like visiting there, and I find it an inspiring place. So yeah. I try and go to Japan once a year, and Europe once a year. Um, you know, I try and I, I, I travel with our design team, so we try and go play, try and go to a different place every year that we think is like an inspiring place, and shop the market and figure out some trend stuff, and then, you know, um, I travel around here and there. I go to LA a fair amount for different opportunities, but I get to travel a, a, a fair amount. You're at, do you feel like your design team or you are more inspired by fashion trends that are happening or like? Places or you know things or art. It's it's all of that. So okay. I, I think you know since we're mostly um, a knit product and socks, we think a lot about you know the way colors come together and knits, and we will shop sweaters as well as socks. You know when we're looking at stuff. Yeah. And just the way like people are dressing and putting things together, and how can we like f make enough product that f that sort of fits into the way people are living their lives now. Yeah. I think a lot of apparel companies are trying to build a brand around an idea and asking their customers to come into their idea, into this like beautiful world that they're creating and take on our idea of what you know life should look like or feel like. And our idea is just kind of the opposite. We wanna just fit into whatever it is you're doing. We don't care what you're doing. We're not asking you to run faster or run a mile under a certain element. Like for us, you want to you you're pushing your grandkids around all day. We want to make you comfortable doing that. You work downtown, like you're running upstairs. Cool. You sit around all day. We want you to be more comfortable doing that and thinking about it that way and having just sort of classic designs and some fun fashion stuff to go along with it. It's really about supporting people in their everyday life, and I think you can draw inspiration on that from all different sources. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you, you've talked a bit about, obviously, about the charitable mission. Actually, I'm just curious. Do you do one-for-one t-shirts as well? Yeah. T to shelters? Same, yeah. Same yeah, yeah. So we work with our shelters to develop the donation product. We start with the idea of the same core product that we are making that we're going to donate. And then we usually tweak it to improve it for that audience. So we think about the product we donate as going to our non-paying customers. And we want the same level of research for that audience as we have for our paying customers. So with our socks, we found early on we'd be donating socks and if I was in the subway giving someone a pair of socks, occasionally I'd hear like, I don't want this. Do you have anything that's darker? And it got us thinking. We started talking to shelters and they said, you know what, people, darker colors show less visible wear. So there's like a dignity element there. And we were like, okay, what else? 
and they need to last longer. So we reinforce the seams and we add an antimicrobial treatment to the socks so that between washes they stay fresh longer. So just things like that and the same approach for the t-shirt. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Um, you, one, uh, one thing that I feel like I, you haven't touched on yet is just how much um, innovation you put into the socks as well. Not just you know on that side of the table, on the homeless yeah. side of the table, but for the average wearer. Sure, yeah. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got there and how you did that research. I think in the beginning for us it was just, you know, we tried everything. We looked out there and, and then there was, you know, Dave, my partner, he, he had sensitivity issues as a kid and he'd wear his socks inside out because of the toe seam. So we're like, there's got to be a better way to do that. And we found a better way to do that. So we have like a hand linked toe seam. And when you put it on, there's no annoying ridge across the top of your toes. And then the, the cotton that we use, when you think about cotton, the staple length, I mean, I can get super sock nerdy if you want, but yeah. the basic idea is we thought about every step of the way, you know, the tension level on a calf sock so it stays up and doesn't fall down, but won't leave marks on your leg. Just little things like that all the way up and down up the product. So you put it on, most people put on our socks and they go, I don't know what's going on here, but these are really comfortable and I don't want to wear any other. They don't have to know that we call it honeycomb or arch support or a seamless toe or a Y-stitched heel, you know, or have stamp technology in our calf socks, but yeah. they know that there's something better there and we are the ones f really focused on engineering and re-engineering machines so that they can do what we want them to do for our socks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I... I I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in my day-to-day -day life in Brooklyn that have them on their kids and have them on their own feet. And kids love them, yeah, right? Kids love them, especially yeah. the Sesame Street ones. Those yeah, those did really well. <laughs> Very strong. How long into your business model did you have kids? That was probably three years in. Yeah. Yeah. I have to imagine it's been a very fast growth. It's been good. It could be better. Yeah. For some reason, I, I don't think we've totally unlocked that yet. You just totally touched on something with me, with my four-year-old who screams that everything's too tight and hates her socks. I haven't tried Bombas yet, sorry. Um, <laughs> but I think that's what I'm about to go home and do. It's unbelievable. <laughs> because I didn't even think about the seam thing, but that's exactly what she's complaining about, but she doesn't know how to say that. Right. Um, but that's what's bothering her. Um, we should so. figure out a way to like subversively market two four-year-olds, not to the parents. Yes, so they can figure definitely. out to use the words. Yeah, right. exactly. Yes, too tight is usually the biggest phrase I hear. Got it. <laughs> um, so did you ever have a, a, pa a point in your career path that you feel like you made a huge mistake? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you think about my career path, I feel like I made a mistake all the, all the time. <laughs> um, so I took a job and that I didn't love and then I got laid off and it's a terrible feeling. And I felt like I had made a mistake taking that job versus another job that I had been offered. And then when I didn't get a job right away afterwards and I had to go you know, work in a restaurant, I felt feel like a little bit of a failure, but it turned into be the, the best thing for me, right? Um, you learn a different sort of angle on the world and you know, an opportunity came out of it. So. Uh, I think it's just full of mistakes, and there's always going to be the feeling of mistakes and failure. That's just kind of part of it. Yeah. But, you know, you stay positive and you keep your eyes open, and I think it usually works that's out, and you end up the place you're supposed to end up. Yeah. Great. Not that this is the end. I'm not that old, you know, yeah. but you know what I mean. But you're happy with where you are at this yeah. point in time, which is great, which is the goal. Um, and, I mean, uh, what are you most proud of? I don't know if there was, it's just the launch or if there's anything. I think it's the people, um, the people aspect of our, the team that we've built, the people I get to see every day. You know, most, uh, you go to work, you're there a lot. And you just want to be around people that you want to be around, which is nice. And that's what we've built. So we built a culture that kind of worked the way that a lot of places we worked didn't work, right? Yeah. We wanted it to feel great. And we wanted, when I was working at places and I had bosses that kept information from us or didn't let us in on the things that we were curious about or, you know, created a culture of fear or uh, whatever it was. We, we thought about a lot of those things when we were building Bombas and we just wanted to make a, a place where everyone's background and experience could come into the company and contribute something that we couldn't have thought of and it was just sort of, sort of weird stew of interesting people. And that that is like, a, it's a great thing to see. Yeah, that's great. Do you do anything, you know, that's a little bit more in the, I don't know, new age company to, to keep it fresh in the office? Um, 
I mean, yeah, we have a great office environment, but the yeah. policies are good. We have unlimited yeah. vacation, and we travel on two retreats a year with the whole company. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, there's, like, dogs in our office, and it's a little chaotic, but it's good. Yeah. Um, you know, we pay for, like, all of the health care, and you get wellness credit at our company every month. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's just a pretty, like, open-minded uh, bunch. Yeah. And we have volunteer opportunities every week. Oh, wow. Which is a big part of what we do. You know, yeah. we want to stay connected to the mission and why we started the company yeah. and the dona donation aspect. So if you go and work at one of the shelters that we're partnered with for two hours in the middle of the workday and come back, you know, all of a sudden the things that you're working on don't seem as pressing, urgent, or important. And we like that because it just reminds us why we're all here and doing what we're doing yeah. and what really matters in the world. Yeah, that's great. Um, do you, did you ever feel like there was was there an aha moment where you just felt like, oh, I know this is going to take off. I know this is going to be, this is going to be great. Um, I don't know. I, g I guess, you know, there's a point where you're like a million dollars of sales. Like people bought a million dollars of socks. That sounds so dumb, <laughs> but you know, like it's like a, a marker. Yeah. Um, th some of this stuff, like we thought it would take, you know, 10 years to donate our first million pairs of socks. And it happened in two and a half years. And we were like, wow, this is really like going the right way. So, you know, and then some of our big markers are around storytelling, videos that we release that help raise the profile of the brand, you know, online. We built most of it, you know, online. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, when you were on Shark Tank, you said, uh, we haven't done any sort of marketing yet. So now we have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, did, what did you do? What was the first thing that you did when you stepped out with marketing? Um, first thing we did was try and hire someone who's really smart about you know, technical marketing. Someone who understands the algorithms and how to manipulate data to improve our chances of converting, you know, new customers. Yeah, my, my retargeting has been very high actually since yeah since our first conversation. In okay, the fall. good. All right. <laughs> I've been getting hit up quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah I mean, we we lead we lead great. with marketing. Uh, you yeah. know, we're a brand-led company, but that also. For us, it takes marketing. Some companies can do everything by word of mouth or open stores and use that as the way to bring people in. And for us, we've had a lot of success marketing and that you have to be really nimble. It's a crazy world. Yeah, and I think some of what I've heard too, you've had, you have a very high return rate of customer, return yeah. rate in that the customers come back. Yeah, repeat rate is, repeat, is super yeah. high. Yeah. Yeah, people try them. We have a very high repeat rate within three months and then another super high one within two years. Our wow. socks last a long time. Yeah, yeah, careful. Careful how good your product is, I guess. Is, is an issue if they're lasting for 10 years, no one's going to come back for them. You should never have socks for 10 years, yeah. even even Bombas. That's kind of gross. <laughs> um, who do you feel like is the most interesting person you've met throughout your career and why? The most interesting person I've met. It doesn't have to be like a famous person either. It could be someone who just taught you something really interesting. Yeah, so I mean, some of the most interesting people that we've met are people who work at the organizations that we support. So there's a company called Back on My Feet. It's a charity that supports, that helps people experiencing homelessness try and exit out of homelessness, transition out of homelessness through the discipline of running. So basically, they started these run clubs, and it's now a big national organization. And they've got people running the marathon and using that. And it's crazy. And the people who run that organization are super inspiring. And they've taught us a lot about our mission and how to donate products and working with the homeless community. So like, those guys are amazing. There's this guy named Isaac who 52 weeks out of the year is on a, in a van every Tuesday night. And he goes around handing out bombas and blankets and soup and food out of this van that's like kitted out and, and he does it in, the, in, New York. in New York so wow. we, we go out with him it's like hard to get a spot to help him out because it's a great experience and he knows all the members of the, the people know when he's coming and where to line up and you just end up having great conversations and someone like that who works and then every single Tuesday night of his life comes home and goes out and does that until 10 at night it is a really inspiring people that just remind us that we're all part of this community in New York and we're all connected and part of the same thing and you know we got to look out for each other and those are sh those are the people who inspire me the most. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, hmm. So so in the in the points of time when you've kind of pivoted your career, did you did you feel like it was a big struggle to get going or did you feel like you were able to leverage? No, skills? no, struggle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a lot. Of I mean, you're just never quite confident. 
uh, or I wasn't in certain moves, but I mean, at some point you realize you have nothing to lose and you want to do certain things and have certain experiences and you go for it, you know? Yeah. So it's always a bit of a struggle, uh, but I look back and those are exciting times. So, you know, it's, it's sort of how you color it and tell the story. Yeah. Anything boring, you're going to be just falling asleep at your desk. It's much more fun to challenge yourself. Yeah, I don't think you guys would be in this class if you want to just sort of like, you know, be an accountant. Yeah. No <laughs> offense <laughs> to <Okay>. children, <laughs> relatives of very fun accountants. Yeah. Do you feel like there's anything you would have done differently in college to have prepared yourself for the career path you ended up having? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, it took me a while to get where I was going. But if I had known, maybe it would have wouldn't have worked. Or uh, so I have. I wouldn't change anything. I think college is about learning how to learn, and meeting people, and you know, sort of getting your footing in the world, in the real world, and sort of that transition time. I don't remember all the any specifics of classes or things that I learned. You know, like that I could recite and come and teach. Uh, but the rigor of the work was important. And you know, knowing that I enjoyed that, and then the social—I mean, yeah—I don't—I wouldn't change a thing. Social experience gets you your network, which is sure huge. Um, it's, how, it's how you met me, basically, through yeah, a college friend. Right? For sure. <laughs> um, did uh, did is there anything in particular you look for when you're looking for those entry-level candidates to join your company? Yeah, I, I look for people who um, kind of understand how our business ticks and are curious about the way it works and curious about finding out the position they're in and how it how it relates to the company overall. So I want someone who's coming in for an entry level position and trying to and, and maybe has an idea but wants to to know that that job can affect the company, right? Most people think of your job description and the role and the department, but if that job wasn't there, the company would be different and I want to know how my role if I'm that can have an effect on the company overall. And I want someone who's curious about that and, and interested in having an impact in our company. Because we don't want people who are just trying to do a job and then move on to something else. We want someone who can come in thinking, even in an entry level position, yes, I'm gonna learn a lot from some really cool people, but I'm also gonna have an impact on this great company. I'm yeah. gonna be a part of it. Yeah. And that desire and commitment and willingness to sort of be open to that, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. In Great. a candidate. Yeah. Are you guys doing anything around sustainability at all? Or yeah. at least starting to think about it? Yeah, we think about it. I mean, I, I think you think about sustainability, it's like a buzzword. Yeah. It's almost people are sick of hearing it. You go to a trade show now, and it's what every company is talking about, and it means something different. And it's like the way people use organic as like a marketing tactic. It's, it's the right intention, mm -hmm. but you have to make sure what it means for your company. So the first thing is defining that, yeah. and then trying to decide if you're going to publicly tell stories around it, right? Which is how we're hearing about most of this stuff. Yeah. So is sustainability the idea that since we have less than 2% return rate on our product, and the industry average is 20%, that less packages are being sent around because of that? And like, is that a sustainability story we wanna tell? Is it about the way that our factories recycle and use water? and the way that our product gets from the factory to the DC and from the DC to the customer, right? There's a lot of elements of that and having a good understanding of it and not just trying to use the buzzword yeah. uh, is the most important thing, I think. Yeah, I think I was just mentioning you, I, w I was just mentioning to you before class, last semester I had an Aya Kanai from, um, from Cosmo, she's the chief fashion editor there and she was saying basically sustainability should be a part of your model no matter who you are or what you're doing right now, but don't think that you are gonna you know, win with your company just because you have a sustainable model and that's the only thing you're talking about. Yeah. It has to be good product. It has to be thoughtful product. And obviously the charitable mission, I think, is another. Yeah, that's the same thing, right? There should be some, you should have some understanding of how your company plugs into our community. Yeah. Whether you're giving a product for every product you sell or not, you should have an understanding of what your company represents and how it connects to society as a whole. And yeah. it's the same thing with sustainability, right? Yeah. Is that about recycling? Well, there's a huge issue with recycling right now, and there's a lot that you can read about. Look at what Patagonia, they're not, they're, they're holding all of their recycled materials until they can devise a better solution what to do with it because most of those products were being sent to China and China's not taking products anymore and we're having an issue figuring out what to do with recycled products and things that are getting recycled. So it's, it's about, I think, 
being a being smart but care you have to care as the first step yeah and know that customers care and figure out the best thing the best way forward so we we think a lot about it and we're working on a plan yeah great so i guess my my, my final question would be what piece of advice advice do you have for someone who is looking to launch their own business yeah i mean i guess a lot of people will tell you when you're looking to launch your business you're going to hear a lot of no's and that's true but you're also going to hear a lot of yeses so um, just be aware of the like false yes and beware of the false no and you have to trust your gut and just give it a chance um, also surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are trust me they're out there um, you know that's an important thing like people who know things that you don't know about or have done things or can help you along the way but uh, always you know remember to check yourself keep your lens stay humble and try it you know what happens if you work on something for two years? It sounds like a long time, but in 10 years, I promise you it won't. So, you know, there's no harm in trying some of these things and giving it a go. The experiences you get will be valuable along the way. I know that companies and startups love to hire people that have failed startups too. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of experience that comes from not succeeding. And then if it works and, you know, you end up sitting in a position like this, it's great, then you can pass on that knowledge to someone else. But I just say go for it, trust your gut, um, stay humble, and surround yourself with really smart people. Great, good, great advice. Okay. So I wanna turn it around to you guys, um, let you kick off with some questions. We do unfortunately need to use the microphone for questions just because we are filming for the video, or for the library rather, so um, I'm gonna, pass it at least the first time but then if you're gonna pass it on the second time make sure to do it who wants to kick off all right you're gonna challenge me about being on the other side of the room <laughs> hi so you said that four of you guys started the company initially Yep. Did any of you come from a fashion or a design background at all? None of us. Um, seems like a disadvantage. Turns out, it, 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 looking back on it, I think it was an advantage in this category that we could approach it from more of a consumer mindset. You know, if we had had the experience to say, like, oh, no, 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 we can't do a seamless toe on a consumer sock for, you know, the everyday, that adds three pennies per sock. and the unit economics won't work out, and you don't have the margin structure to support it. Let's think of something else. But instead, we were just like, let's build the thing that we want to build as people who wear socks. Um, now, we're hiring a lot of people with fashion experience, because uh, that's helpful at this stage of our company, mm -hmm. that experience and going the go-to-market experience. But in the beginning, I think it helped us. And if we were just stuck with that, though, it would have become a disadvantage. So you didn't have any initial um you know, really big challenge that you faced uh, having that, you know, lack of knowledge. Like you said, you didn't bring in anyone until later on. Well, we, we brought in a friend to design the first, like, product. Um, I mean, we couldn't, we didn't know what a tech pack was. Like, we couldn't communicate effectively with a factory. <coughs> and without the design, we needed someone who could translate ideas into design. So we had a friend who was working at the time, I guess, at, he had worked at Hickey and then at, Bonobos and Land's End, and he had a lot of experience uh, as a designer, and we couldn't afford to hire him, but he consulted early on, and then eventually came on, and now he's our head of design. Perfect. And I just have one uh, follow-up question, too. Sure. You said the, um, the original reason behind the, uh, the sock, specifically because it's the most requested piece of clothing for homeless shelters, is there a reason behind the T-shirt? Yeah, so the, the next logical product for us, uh, this is a great question, was underwear. And we also surveyed all of our customers. Um, underwear is also another wear-through item that you're not allowed to donate used underwear to shelters. Um, and then kind of third in line is T-shirts because, you know, especially as like a base layer for clothing, like T-shirts are important. So we were starting out in that world and then also asking our customers what they wanted from us. And most of our customers are buying from us because of partly because of the mission and they care about that, but a lot of it is because of comfort. You know, we've become known as like having a super comfortable product and that's what really differentiates our product and they want that same idea, Bombas Comfort in other products and t-shirts and underwear were kind of the next two they mentioned. And we started with t-shirts because we had the expertise in house 
And if I had to do it again, I probably would have waited and figured out underwear first um, before we launched T-shirts. But underwear is coming, um, you know, by next year at the latest. A little more technical too, right? Like to get yeah, it it's just a different. If you're going to revolutionize that, like you did with a sock, you kind of have to. You need the expertise, yeah. yeah. And especially at our scale now, we can't launch the way we did and just kind of hope it works. Um, just so you guys are aware, the sign-in sheet is also coming around. Ah, oh, thank you. That's even better. <laughs> you mentioned visiting China uh, a, lo a little earlier about, like, resources and everything. Yep. Have you seen any impact with the coronavirus and everything? Um, yeah, so there is certainly an impact that we're planning around. Um, we've had to cancel some of our team's trips to China, uh, development team and the sourcing team. Um, and I don't know what the full extent is going to be, but we do have other manufacturers in other parts of Asia and in the United States and in Canada and in Peru. So as far as our infrastructure is concerned, we'll be fine. Um, we are concerned about the health and safety of the people who work in the factories that we engage with. So we're just like hoping for the best and hoping for a speedy solution and resolution to this. Um, and I'm not really sure what the final impact is going to be on our supply chain, but it's not a great situation, you know, for our business. Uh, but it's unclear. For right now, we're okay, and we've, we haven't had any impact, but we'll, we'll see. And then um, I had a follow-up. Sure. With tariffs and everything, do you guys think that you would pull out of China potentially? So we have, um, we have a pretty good situation with tariffs. With the way that our business is set up and the category that we're in, and where we fulfill out of, we avoid some of the tariffs that have been an issue for a lot of apparel companies. Uh, we, pay appar we pay tariffs on our wholesale product, but not on our direct-to-consumer product, and we pay par tariffs on apparel, but not on. So there, the, the, we think about it a lot, and there are ways to be smart about how you're setting up your business practices. But <clears throat> the fact that some companies have been leaving China has been an opportunity for us since we can stay. and. Mm -hmm. It's helped us with terms and things like that. That's great. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, like, firstly, when you get into the market, how do you open that, like, like target customers? And did you spend any money on adver advertisement or yeah. like marketing tools? In the beginning, um, we didn't spend any money because we didn't have any money, and. We were worried that nobody would come, right? So it's like a, we launched Indiegogo. <coughs> we saw a lot of success there, and we had a few thousand customers from that campaign. Mm -hmm. So what we had was an email list of people, and what we had was our networks, and, and then we started to bring someone in who could help us start to figure out the marketing piece. But we didn't want to pretend that we could do it ourselves, and we weren't exactly sure how to do it. We knew how to make good content and creative, and we used organic social, and we used our networks, and we used the customers that we had gotten from Indiegogo, and we just started to build from there. Um, and then we started doing a little, bit mar a little bit of marketing, and then Shark Tank helped as well. So there, it just went in stages. So in the beginning, it's possible to do it without a big budget, without a lot of money, and you just have to be careful, you just have to be really, um, I think you have to treasure your early customers and take care of them and that's where a lot of the like early momentum came from. So we started out probably the first nine months of the business with zero dollars spent on marketing. Uh, sorry, can I just yeah. ask one more about like sure. product development? Like how often, how often do you like do new products? Um, do you just like? Redesign? Well, within Socks, we have new releases every month. Um, you know, we design on a seasonal calendar, but um, we're trying to have new stuff coming on the site on a monthly basis. And then new product development, we're really focused on socks, tees, and underwear for the next three or five years. So we're developing products within those categories, but um, yeah, I mean, having something regular to talk about with our current customers is a big part of our business. Okay, so you mentioned that your company is, ma uh, is mainly technical. How has social media helped your company um, to get bigger? I mean, it's kind of all of it. 
you know. Um, when we started out, it was a lot of organic social, <clears throat> and then it was a lot of paid social. We kind of looked like organic social. We make a lot of videos and create a lot of content, and we lean on our marketing team to optimize that content and find new customers. <coughs> so a lot of that's through Facebook and Instagram and you know, YouTube and TikTok and whatever. <laughs> Was it easy um, getting your followers or? No, 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 no. And, you know, for us, I, I think a lot of companies really focus on building a big organic social audience for us. We've really focused on paid marketing success and then building out our own internal list over email and our customer base and focus on making those people happy. We never really cared about the numbers of our organic followers, it doesn't reflect the scale or size of our business. It's just one approach. Some companies are really good at that word of mouth idea and organic social and having a big, bigger microphone. But the truth is the way that social media works these days, those companies, they won't let you talk to your audience uh, for free. So even if you have 20 million followers, there's only a small percentage that would ever see a post that you put out if it didn't have any spend behind it. And they, they stopped doing that, you know, like five, six, seven years ago. It's just, you know, they were leaving so much money on the table. But those companies that launched e-commerce businesses in 2000 and, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, instead of 2013 when we launched, they had years where they anything they posted, it was like a paid post and it was free, and now they're paying millions of dollars for that, that work. So um, it's an expensive way to do it. But we figured out a way to make it work from the beginning and to be profitable. Thank you. Sure. Well, oh, down here. So you were saying, like, um, first and foremost, the product and the and the quality is important. Like, like socks without this this seam, you know. How would you change that for a T-shirt and underwear to make it like? a product that is different than what is out there already? And yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good question. It's tougher to differentiate in those categories. There are already a lot of players trying to improve on you know, what's out there. <clears throat> and there weren't a lot of people thinking about socks. They've always been a bit of an afterthought. But that doesn't mean there's not a way to focus in the same way on the little things that make a big impact on everyday comfort. So if we take the same approach to a t-shirt and think about the, the type of cotton that we use, the way that a seam is constructed, you know, how like the sweep is or how it's fit and thinking about the, the, the fit and the design and the construction and the materials and lots of little improvements add up to a big impact on everyday comfort. Um, I was more. just thinking I'll put up on your website too so we can, we can see what you're talking about. Valentine's Day is coming up. Ah. If you guys are interested. That's a good, that's a good gift. You know, nothing says I love you like an, a year f supply of socks, I think. <laughs> yeah, so. <coughs> and then his t-shirt. And so they're merino. That's a merino t-shirt. That's oh, why it's wildly off. expensive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, how much is your cotton? Thirty-six dollars. Okay. And then there's pack discounts. There and, we go. You know. Good to see you. Other questions on? Hi. Hi. Um, I have a few questions, okay. if you don't mind. I see you have um, a notebook there, so. Yeah, All lots right. of notes. Um, so after Kick, uh, Indiegogo, and then. Shark Tank, were, those, were there ad any additional rounds of funding that you guys went through to build your team up to 130? Yeah, the company? Um, there were. So we had an initial seed round <coughs> from friends and family. Um, basically, we just asked all the people we knew if they knew any rich people and <laughs> raised money that way. We didn't want to go to a VC. We just didn't want the sort of uh, pressures that come along with that, the yep. time horizons. I think we would have built a very different business. So. We took investors, we raised the seed round, and then we did a Series A round with that same group of investors and some of their friends, and that's it. So we've built you know, a business, a multiple hundreds of millions of dollar business on raising $4 million. 
the kind of um, like Indiegogo with the people that really cared about the purpose and like kind of sourcing from the same group. I mean, they were investors, the people who invested. Oh, investors. I okay. mean, they're like wealthy individuals or people who invest in small companies. Got it. But <clears throat> they didn't, you know, by doing the round ourselves rather than going to one big venture capitalist or something like right. that, we were able to control the terms and we didn't have, normally you would go and uh, these venture capitalists, they want a huge success. Mm -hmm. So they'll make a hundred bets on small companies and they'll give you money and they'll give you a high valuation. And then by the time you're, if you're running out of money, you have to raise money at a higher valuation. And they don't care if you're moderately successful. They yeah. want something that's like a grand slam. Or, and then if it goes to zero, as long as one of those 100 is a huge hit for them, mm -hmm. they don't care about the others. So they make a bunch of bets and they hope it works out. But that puts a lot of pressure on your company to be yeah. perfect from the beginning. And growing, yep. And we grew quickly, and we were profitable quickly, but yep. we didn't want to have that pressure, and we wanted to control it a little bit more. We didn't want someone else's ideas influencing how we ran our business or built our culture or built the donation side of the business. It was just very important for us to do things our way, which is a little bit weird, and, but built a, we built a solid foundational business. A lot of startups are struggling to get profitable or mm -hmm. to do things a certain way, and we built that in from the beginning. Are your investors involved in, in anything day to day or? No. No. Mm -mm. no. Yeah. That's also a nice way yeah. to be set up. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, you talked a little bit as, um, about like unlocking a potential. Like I think, you know, you aren't quite there. You, like you see the potential for future growth. What do you think of the next steps in terms of really unlocking those key pieces to get to bigger? Oh, I, I was referring to our like our kids' business. Oh, kids' business. Okay. I feel like that there's a potential there to make that a much bigger part of our business. Got it. But there's, I mean, there's still a lot that we can unlock generally in our core business. Yep. The big growth levers for us are growing our core sock business online, mm -hmm. new products like T-shirts and underwear, yep. international expansion, wholesale expansion, and then eventually our own stores. So those okay. are the five areas that we know are in front of us that can sort of lead to big growth for our company. Those, if we focus on the timing of those five things, we should do, we should do all right. Cool. Yeah, that was my other question was if you were planning to open up brick and mortar stores at some point. At some point, yeah. That. I think when we have the right product mix and when we have the right reason Got to it. have it, you know, I Thank mean, I want to build a community store, <coughs> a place where you know, you can go to a yoga class at Lululemon or meet up at yep. a Nike store and go running. It'd be great if you can come to a Bomba store and, you know, meet up to volunteer, right. something like that. Last question is, um, can you talk a little bit about your target demographic or your target audience? Is there It's kind of anyone with feet. Yeah. Um, hmm. But, okay. Um, it sounds like a, I, our demographic curve is like super flat. We have as Got many it. people over 65 as under 25. Mm -hmm. Uh, under 50k in, re in income as over 150k. I think everybody thinks this product is for them because it sucks and because <clears throat> we have more people who are sort of spending more on our product than they're used to spending than people who are coming down from like fancier sock brands, right? Okay. So we're taking more market share from Hanes or Champion than we are from Balega or someone like that who makes like a fancy running sock. Um, so we try and be pretty democratic. We're, we're building this brand for everyone, but mm -hmm. it's a high quality product that um, I think fits into a lot of different lifestyles and we think of it that way. Cool. And, you know, I mean, most socks in the U.S. are bought by men, the majority, but we have 70% female customers, but the product split is closer to 50-50. So that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Repeat behind you. <laughs> So the sort of like the branding of Bombas is really centered on this like idea of the bee and sort of like yeah. a community or like a hive. Yeah. Have you ever done any sort of campaign or interaction with like a Save the Bees movement? We, you know, it's funny. We thought about that. We've thought about that a lot um, just because it's, it was a, a news story for a long time. You know, we thought eventually, though, we said, you know, we have to focus on the, the issue that matters most to us, which is homelessness. And that was a big lesson in that 
this thing seemed like natural, right? Like mm-hmm. you've got this issue, bees are dying off. It's like a mystery. And people say when the bees go, the humans are next. And it's terrifying, like bees are dying. Um, and our brand is built around the idea that you know, Bombas comes from the Latin word for bumblebee. And we like the bees are small, but they have a big impact on the world. And there's a lot there. But when we decided not to do something that's a powerful thing, right? We need to focus on the thing that matters most to us. We need to tell the same story over and over and over again until if we're not sick of telling our brand story, then we're not telling it enough. Because people, you know, it takes a long time to get the, r- the recognition and the customers that you're looking for if you're trying to really build something. So uh, that was a very good lesson in focus. It's also a very good idea. So um, I've noticed that a lot of relatively new brands, uh, like Everlane, for example, are taking basics but making it better. And I sort of see that in your business model. So um, besides product development, how else do you differentiate yourselves from other brands? Like you do have your um, CSR. Um, Is it like you focus on customer service, uh, marketing, or stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we we hope to be really excellent at all of the areas that you mentioned. you know, I think we take a higher, we take a, a more intense approach to research, development, innovation, and product design than most companies, including Everlane. I think we're just more obsessed with the product quality because we know that no matter what we do at that point to market it, we feel good about it. Um, but yeah, our customer service is all in-house. I think that sets us apart. Um, you've heard of this, this stat, lifetime value. Have you heard of this? So you can measure like the value of a customer by how much you expect them to spend over their lifetime. It's like a measurable stat. <clears throat> and customers who reach out and have an interaction with our in-house customer service team have a two times higher lifetime value than customers who don't. So I think service sets us apart. Um, you know, that product leads to a really low return rate, the mission aspect. But the number one and number two reason people are buying our product is for comfort that high quality product and the commitment to give back to their community. So those are the things I think that help us stand out and those are the stories that we try and tell to, to help us stand out in a very crowded marketplace. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so great. Well, thank you great. so much for being here and hopefully if you don't mind sticking around for five or 10 minutes, sure. as a private question they don't feel like as- asking publicly. I'll be here. We can, can do that. Um, but we really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome.